We have been in a series over the last couple of weeks called Unwavering. And what we've been doing is we've been looking in 1 John, and um, for those who maybe are new to this place, not to be confused with the Gospel of John. The Gospel of John is Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John earlier in the New Testament. 1 John, keep going to the right. And uh, it's a little bit before the book of Revelation. And so we have been looking through 1 John, and there's a lot there, as you might have found if you've been reading through this on your own. But we're, today we're going to be looking in 1 John chapter 2, and we're going to look in verses 15 through 17. 1 John chapter 2, verses 15 through 17. Do not love the world, nor the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the boastful pride of life is not from the Father, but is from the world. The world is passing away, and also its lust. But the one who does the will of God lives forever. I want us to go back to verse 15 here. And uh, this is going to be our memory verse for today. So you guys ready to have a memory verse today? All right. So I want you to repeat this after me. Do not love the world, nor the things in the world. Let's try that again. Do not love the world, nor the things in the world. Okay, I want to see if you can do it without looking at the screens. Do not love the world. Very good. All right, you guys. Um, it's important to, to, to develop that, uh, that habit of memorizing scripture. But today I'm going to entitle this sermon, I Don't Love Her Anymore. I'm not talking about my wife, by the way. <laughs> I don't love her anymore. Now, I'd be lying if I didn't say that we didn't have some good times together. There aren't some things that are tempting to want to even go back to from time to time. But I've learned that it is a dangerous thing to love something or someone that does not love you back. Amen. And I believe that it is important for us as Christians to learn how to fall out of love. Amen. That sounds like a crazy thing to say, isn't it? It is important that we learn how to fall out of love because we will never fall in love with Jesus until we've learned how to fall out of love with the world. So my hope is that all of us will be able to say, I don't love her anymore. And I'm talking about the world. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I am asking that as we open up your word, that you would open up our hearts. Lord, I'm asking that you would speak to us in a way like only you can. If anything has caused our ears to be clogged or our minds to be clouded or our hearts to be hardened, I'm asking that you would remove it, that we might hear what you want to speak to us. In Jesus' name, amen. Last week we were in chapter 1 and the beginning of verse, uh, chapter 2. And we were looking at verses 5 towards the end and we looked at verse 5 which says, um, God is light and in him... There is no darkness at all. If you weren't here last week, that was kind of the memory verse that we had. Um, God is light, and in him there is no darkness at all. And then we began to look at two paths of what it looks like to walk in the darkness and then what it looks like to walk in the light. And then we finished by looking in the first two verses in chapter 2, and uh, that's good. He says, my dear children, I'll write these things so that you may not sin. And if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, meaning someone who comes along and helps us. Isn't it good to know that we have a God that calls us and challenges us, but also is willing to forgive us and to transform us and to heal us? And so we see that, and it lets us know that he is the atoning sacrifice, the propitiation for our sins, meaning that whatever it is that our sin costs, he paid the price for that already. And so it ended last week in verse 2, but now we started in verse 15. 
And so from verses 3 through 14, there's some really powerful um, verses there, but we are kind of limited in terms of how much time we're going to be able to spend in each, uh, each verse because this is a limited series. Uh, but also, we're going to hit some of these topics a little bit later in 1 John. But when we get to verse 15, what we find is John has been giving people confidence in who God has called them to be. He was writing to children, he was writing to fathers, he was writing to the young men, but now he goes from giving them confidence to giving them a command. And here's his command in verse 15. He said, do not love the world, nor the things in the world. Now this is kind of interesting that the command that he's given them is what not to love. Because so much of scripture is about learning how to love. Right? In fact, a little bit later in chapter 4, verse 8 in 1 John, it lets us know that God is love. But why would he command us to not love? Do not love the world. And then it goes, just in case you were confused, nor the things in the world. And then he doesn't just leave it there. He actually tells us in the second part of verse 15 why we are not to love the world. It says, if anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. You know, years ago, there was this song by a a group called Black Sheep. It says, you can get with this or you can get with that. And what we find is that there is a get with this or get with that type of scenario that is painted here. You can love the world or you can love the Father. But it's important that we understand the conjunction is not a and, it's a or. You can love the world or you can love the Father, but you cannot love the world and love the Father. It says it like this in the book of James, James chapter four, verse four. He says, do you not know this, that, um, First, he called them you adulterous generation, but we'll skip that part. He says, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity towards God? Meaning that we can't even be neutral if we're friends with the world. We're enemies with God. And so this is what he's saying. He's like, you can love the world or you can love God. Because here's the thing that we have to understand. We will never learn how to love God until we have learned how to fall out of love with the world. You know, I think about it, it's like, you know, when when it comes to sports, we kind of understand this, don't we? It's like, you cannot love the Bengals and love the Browns at the same time. I I, I don't, anybody in here love both? It's like, you will choose life or you choose, and I'm sure, no, you, right? It's like, there's a sense of like, to be loyal to one means that you're not loyal to the other. And so what, what, what John is doing, John is setting up this scenario, helping them to understand, listen, if you want to love the Father, have the love of the Father in you, do not love the world. So if we're given this command not to love the world, then we've got to be clear on what is meant by the world. Because as we go a little bit further in verse 16, he says, for all that is in the world. So here's, here's what's in the world. The lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the boastful pride of life is not from the Father, but is from the world. So he's describing what does he mean by the world? Because he's saying do not love the world, but hold up, hold up, Pastor. I know John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave. So how could it say that God so loved the world and then turn right around and say do not love the world? Well, you've got to understand the context of what he's talking about here. He's not speaking about the people of the world, but he is speaking about the ways of the world. When he is talking about the world, he is talking about a value system that's built in opposition to the kingdom of God. And so that's why we as Christians are called to be in the world, but not of the world. We we don't have the privilege as believers of living in a little cocoon just kind of isolated from everybody else. We're not distant from the world, but we are distinct from the world. And one of the best things that we can do, in the words of Peter Story in his book, uh, he wrote, In the Crucible with God, he said, one of the greatest gifts that we can give the world is to be different from it. 
And so he is saying, listen, do not love the world. And he describes what the world is. And then he names three different types of things. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the boastful pride of life. Now, now what is meant by this? What does he mean by the lust of the flesh? It's speaking about our fleshly appetites, our, the, the things that we desire. So sometimes that can be a desire for sexual fulfillment. Sometimes it's a desire for food. By the way, think about it. The very first sin that happened that's recorded in Scripture in Genesis 3 came because of food, Right? You think about the temptation that was given to Jesus in Matthew chapter 4, Luke chapter 4. It was, turn these stones into bread. And so we we think about what does it look like to have the lust of the flesh? It is that, 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 that insatiable desire to gratify our flesh at any cost. And by the way, when it comes to gratifying our flesh, it's funny how there's a sense of there's never enough. It's never enough. There's, there's more that you need. There's, 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 okay, you know how it is. You draw a line and say, okay, if I, I'm just going to do this this time. And then after a while, they say, okay, well, next time I'll just do that. The line keeps getting drawn further and further back. Why? Because if your flesh and your appetite is out of control and unrestrained, then there's no telling how far we can go. And so he's talking about the lust of the flesh. And, and the world says, you know what? gratify whatever desires you have, and then we kind of put a little tagline, as long as you don't hurt anybody, except for offending the very God that created you. And so then it talks about the lust of the eyes. Well, what is it talking about when it talks about the lust of the eyes? The lust of the eyes is um, covetousness or greed. It's the thing that got um, Eve in trouble when we see in Genesis chapter 3 that she looked at the fruit and she saw that it was desirable. It's the thing that got David in trouble when he was looking outside of his window when he saw a woman that, that, that was not his. He saw a woman that had another husband and yet because of what he saw, even though he had his own wife, different time. That was not an endorsement of polygamy, but that was different. But, but even though he, he still wanted something else, it's the thing that gets us in trouble, right? When we're scrolling through social media and we see somebody else's life and we're like, I want their spouse. I want their house. I want their lifestyle. I want their body. Man, I really wish that I could have what they had or sing like they can sing or look like they can look or have this kind of background or have this kind of lifestyle. And what happens is we find ourselves Greedy. And then you have, and then you have the boastful pride of life. And, and, and the, the, the pride of life is different than the lust. See, lust is constantly wanting that which you don't have. But the pride of life is finding a false sense of confidence because of what you do have. Because it doesn't just say the pride, it says the pride of life meaning that in life it encompasses your possessions, the things that you have, and we can live in such a way that we build our self-worth based on what we possess rather than who possesses us. And so what John is doing here, he is describing this is how the world is built. This is the value system of this world. That's why in 1 John chapter 5, verse 19, he's able to say this a little bit later on. He said, what does he say? I don't have it memorized yet. Um, It says, we know that we are of God and that the whole world lies in the power of the evil one. So here's the thing with lust or desires is that all of us have desires. Do you know desire within itself is not a bad thing? But see, what happens when we stop trusting in God's ways and we start operating by the world's ways is that we take reasonable, even righteous desires and look to fulfill them in unrighteous ways. So when we talk about, you know, sexual desire, did you guys know that that was not an invention of the devil? You guys looking at me like, crazy. It wasn't like Satan was like, I got it. I got the perfect thing. We're going to create sex. I'm allowed to say that, right, in church? All right, is all right? Um, All right, let's make sure. And and you think about this. 
Satan doesn't create stuff, he just perverts it. And so the desire is not unrighteous, but when we go outside of God's parameters, now we're no longer operating in the kingdom space, now we're operating by the system of the world because we don't trust God to meet the desires that he's creating. Same thing when it comes to desiring nice things. Do you know that God is the one who created beauty? He gave us our eyes. He gave us the ability to see color and to see beauty and to, to recognize those things. That was God's creation. We don't give credit to the devil for that. But when we're unable to be dissatisfied and when greed begins to drive our lives, then what we find is that we can find ourselves now no longer trusting God's ways, but now operating in the kingdom of God. And if you think about greed, here's how greed works. Sometimes some of us are so driven by greed that we wear ourselves out. Not because we need something, but because we want something. And then you have the boastful pride of life. You know what? It is, it is good. It's a good desire to, to want to be validated in a sense and to want to find meaning and purpose in your life. But when it gets perverted is when we find purpose in the stuff that we possess or in the status that we have. And, and if you notice all of these things, think about the order, lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, boastful pride of life. Really, when you think about the order, it starts with that which is more obvious to that which is least likely to be detected. Meaning that as Christians, we can find ourselves really, really strong in dealing with the issues that we can recognize. So we'll talk about, well, you shouldn't lust after this, you shouldn't lust after that, and yet we can still be driven by a sense of pride in our hearts because we think we're better than other people or we think that our value is different because of our status in life. And what John is helping them to see, that is not from God, that is from the world. Do not love the world, do not long after that. Because he goes a little bit further in verse 17, he says, the world and its lust are passing away, but he who does the will of God will abide forever. See, we say this all the time around here. Never sacrifice what you want most for what you want now. And this is how the, 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 the lust in our lives operate is that we can find ourselves so full of, of desires that we will forget our greater love to go after a cheaper version of love. And what John is warning them, do not love the world. Now you have to ask yourself, why would he have to warn them not to love the world? Because more than likely, he understood even as Christians, by the way, he's writing this to believers. He's not writing this to the world. Like he's not writing this to those who aren't even serving God and saying, hey, don't love the world. It's like, what else are they gonna love? Like, of course they're gonna love the world. He's speaking to the church. And he's saying, do not love the world. The reason he has to tell them that is because I believe that we can find ourselves drawn to want to fall back in love with that which can destroy us. And so the question becomes, how do we not only fall out of love with the world, but how do we stay out of love with the world? Well, that's a great question. And here's what I want to look at. I want to look at three basic things, and this is going to be so basic that it might actually be offensive how simple this is. But I believe that this is going to help us to stay out of love with the world because sometimes, like it tells us in Isaiah 53, 6, that our hearts are prone to stray. We are, we are like sheep prone to stray. So how do, we, how do we stay? One, develop the discipline of no. Develop the discipline of no. The world says, if you want it, and if it makes you feel good, you should be able to enjoy it. The word says, if you want to follow Jesus, deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow me. Do you see how in opposition that is? And so we have to learn how to tell ourselves no. No to that second helping, right? When, when is the last time that you told yourself no? I'm not talking about when someone else told you no, or sometimes we're like, I'm learning how to say no to other people. Beautiful. 
When is the last time you learned how to say no to you? I want to sleep in today. No. I'm getting up. Do you, know, do you know my body gets offended every time I talk about fasting? You know? And sometimes we want to soften the blow, right? It's like, I'm going to fast HBO. You know, like, okay, all right, you know. But there is something about when you're going to, like, really, like a, a biblical fast, fast from food. Not fast food, but fast from food. My body gets offended. Like, my flesh starts getting offended with me. After all I've done for you, you're going to deny me? I don't want to fast, you know? And I'm thinking, you're right. I don't want to fast, you know? That's when you walk into work and somebody's offering free donuts and you're like, God, I thank you for the sign that you have shown me. I was wondering, Lord, if that was you, but the fact that there is donuts in my office today was verification that was the devil, you know? No, no, fasting is important because sometimes we have to remind ourselves that we're not being led by our appetites, but we're being led by the, the Spirit of God. And, and, and so we can find ourselves uncontrolled appetites. And so we have to learn the discipline, develop the discipline of no. One of the most dangerous adults to meet is an adult that never got told no as a child. We have to learn the word no. Let me show you something here in Titus chapter 2, verses 11 and 12. Titus chapter 2, verses 11 and 12. Listen to what he says. For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all men, instructing us to deny ungodliness and worldly desires and to live sensibly, righteously, and godly in this present age. In the present age. So, so, really, it is the grace of God that teaches us to deny ourselves to say no. So, it's not just about the grit of man, it's about the grace of God. And so, when I feel like, you know what, I'm, I'm weak, guess what? We all are. One of the greatest dangers that you can have is overestimating how strong your flesh is. Well, I can put myself in this situation because my flesh is strong. No, you're not. You're not as strong as you think you are. But here's the great thing, is that we don't have to just rely on willpower, but we can have word power. God's word, as we stand on his word, just as Jesus did when he was tempted in the wilderness, he was able to resist temptation. And so we have to develop that discipline of saying no. No. I'm not going to sleep in today, unless it's a day off, I will. No, my kids don't let me. No, I'm not going to get that third helping of cake. I had to be honest. No, I'm, I'm not going to look at that thing on the screen. No, I know nobody's looking. I know nobody's probably going to ever see this. I know that God can forgive me if I mess up. I know that, and I'm still saying no. Develop the discipline of no. Here's the second thing. Develop the discipline of contentment. The word says, you deserve more. But the word says, everything you have is a gift that God has given you. See, when you have contentment, it does not mean that we don't have ambitions or desires for different things. But what it does mean is that we have learned how to be content. We've learned how to be grateful in every situation that we're in. So we're not feeling like, I would only be happy if I had fill in the blank. See, some of us have lived with that sense, right? Is that if I only had this, then I'd be happy. If I only had this, then I'll be okay. But we've got to develop that discipline of contentment, saying whatever stage of life that I'm in, I've learned to appreciate God right there. You know, Paul said this in Philippians chapter 4. Here's what he says in Philippians chapter 4. He says, I want to start at verse 11. He says, not that I speak from want, for I have learned to be content in whatever circumstances I am. I know how to get along with humble means, and I also know how to live in prosperity. 
In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of being filled and going hungry, both of having abundance and suffering need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. You see how much we miss when we pluck that verse out of context and we just kind of slap it on? You know, I can do all things through Christ's strength. And, you know, if you have a tattoo, that's great. But what I'm saying is this, is that the context is he's talking about being content. When I have a lot, I'm good. When I have a little, I'm still good. Why? Because I've learned the secret of contentment. Learn to live with a sense of appreciation with everything that God has given you. And it doesn't mean that we can't have stuff, but it does mean that stuff won't have us when we have learned to be content. Here's the third thing. Develop the discipline of no, develop the discipline of contentment. And here's the third thing. Develop the discipline of intimacy. Falling out of love with the world is not just living a life of what you can't do. See, that's what Christianity was in my mind for many, many years. It was just a list of all the stuff that I was against and that I couldn't do. I can't do this. I can't do this. Man, I really used to enjoy it, but I can't do that anymore. Oh, well, I'm a, I'm a Christian now, so that means on Friday nights I'll sit in my room, you know, and just kind of chill, you know, do nothing. The world's out there having fun, but I'm staying strong for Jesus. No, it's not just about falling out of love with the world. It's falling in love with Jesus. That's what it's about. But see, here's the thing about intimacy. See, attraction can happen in a moment, but intimacy is cultivated over time. So you might see somebody and immediately you feel an attraction for them. But there's something about getting to know somebody, spending time with someone. So if you think about that from a person-to-person standpoint, how do we develop intimacy with God? Spend time with him. I know some of you might've been waiting for like the deep thing that I was about to say, but it's not, I mean like this is, this is basic. Read your Bible, meditate on your Bible, pray. Listen for him to speak back to you because communication is just not just a one-way street. Learn how to praise and worship. That's one of the things that happens when we sing unto God. Do you know why we do that? It's because something happens when we begin to lift our voices and worship God. Our heart strings of our, of, of, of our hearts begin to open up towards God. And worship takes us from putting ourselves at the center of our focus to putting God at the center of our focus. And so as we begin to learn how to grow close to God, and I'm not just talking about intimacy like I had five minutes a day with Jesus and now I forget about him for the rest of the day. I'm talking about throughout the day, I'm trying to learn how to meditate on his word. I'm trying to learn to be sensitive to the direction of his spirit. I am speaking to him. I'm thanking him. Sometimes prayer is as quick throughout the course of the day of, God, thank you so much for being with me. God, thank you so much for bringing me here safely. Sometimes, sometimes prayer is not just going two hours in a prayer closet, though that's great to have those moments as well, but sometimes prayer also looks like, an intimacy with God looks like on your way walking to a meeting. Lord, I just want to remind you just how much I love you. I love you, Lord. Thank you. It's being mindful of that person throughout the course of the day. Develop that intimacy, right? That's what we have an opportunity to do. And as we fall out of love with this world, we can fall in love with our Lord. And I begin to think about this world and, you know, this sounds kind of funny as I begin to think about it, but it's true. When we fall out of love with the world, then we truly become able to love the world. When we fall out of love with the ways of the world, then we can truly love the people of the world. Because what the world does not need, the world doesn't need just a church that has great programs. And we believe in programs. We've got some great ones coming up. But the church needs more than that. The church doesn't just need, I mean, the world doesn't just need a church that has 
really amazing preaching and, and, and amazing worship. And I know you guys at least have the music part of it. The church, the, the, the church needs to offer more than that. You know what the world needs? The world needs a church that's in love with Jesus. That's one of the best things that we can offer to the world is a church that is in love with Jesus. So when the world is tired of this counterfeit version of love that this world has to offer, this temporary nature of this world value system, that there's something else that they can see that says that's what love is supposed to look like. And so John warns them, be unwavering in your love for God, but do not love the world nor the things in it. I wanna pray for us here today. Heavenly Father, Lord, today, 2023, this command is just as relevant as it was in the first century. Lord, we confess that we are often tempted. We are often tempted to want to go back and love the things of this world. But God, I pray that you would help us in this moment to fall in love with you afresh. Maybe you're here today and you realize that your appetites have been uncontrolled. You've not told yourself no. You've not even known that it was possible to say no. And I wanna let you know it's not by grit, but it's by grace. And you today may need to ask God for his grace. You may realize that you've been so driven by greed and you've not even recognized it until you begin to think about it. It's been your greed that's been driving you, been driving, been the motivating factor in your life. And God is beginning to show you, you know, that, that greed, I wanna deal with that. Maybe you realize that you've become prideful over time. It snuck up on you, it didn't happen all at once, it just kind of snuck up on you over time. You realize that you've started to, to find yourself worth and your value based on the stuff that you possess. And God is letting us know that, hey, I wanna deal with that now. I want you to fall out of love with this world. As you begin to do business with God, I'm gonna, I'm gonna have this song that we were singing in our prayer time. And I want you to, to say, Lord, I need your grace to fall out of love with this world so that I can fall in love with you. And even if you have found yourself having given your life to Christ at one point, but now the intimacy with God is not what it's used to. The great thing is, is that if you draw near to him, he will draw near to you. Amen. Amen. So Lord, I pray that you would help us to love you in Jesus' name. Amen.